First John chapter 4. I want you to notice in First John chapter 4, verse 17, the last part of it, because as he is, so are we in this world. Notice it, because as he is, so are we in this world, because as he is. You see the eternal is in that, because as he is, that's the eternal is, because as he is, so are we. We are as he is. We are not as we used to be, but we are as he is. We are not like we might be. We are as he is. Written to born again, redeemed, blood-bought Christians. I wish tonight, in the few moments we have, that it, there would be some way to communicate to you the reality of that verse to our left over here, right up in that row, then over here, over here, and over here, and up there in the balcony, and over here. I want you to think. Because as he is, so are we. Now notice the beautiful present tense. In this world, not in the next one, not in the next one, in this world. Because as he is, he singular, so are we plural, we become singular. With our pluralities, we become singular, as he is. For some time we have taught the eternal is. Now just pass by forever. What was will never be and what will happen tomorrow does not exist today. We are as he is. That is the reason that why so much contemporary education fails to change and meet the needs of the masses. Because you can educate people as to what was in history. You can educate people of what will be in technical knowledge and advance, advancement in sciences. But it's quite another thing to go out of time and to enter into the principle of the person of Jesus Christ as he is. And instead of being a benefactor of the past, or a benefactor of some advancement we'll make for the future, or a benefactor of the good circumstances now, we are benefactors of who he is, so that we can live as he is in this world. And because, as he is, so are we. Well, who is he? He is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He is immutable and never changes. He has all knowledge, all power, and he's everywhere present, and he never changes. As he is. And because of who he is, so are we. Now you say, Pastor, we're not everywhere present. No. But we're guided by the one that is. We don't have all knowledge, no, but we're guided by, by the one that does. And we are not recipients of all power, no, but we're controlled by one that is. And he's living inside of us. And because he is those things, we are in this world. Now the next verse, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. 
because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also, and that means with that he is love. Not the wall, regulated by how he used to be. Not what will be, but we love each other as he is in this world. Now, there is no fear in love. By the same token, there is no love in fear. And human minds are continually saturated with insecurity in their compound expression derivating back to the fall of Adam. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, Adam said, We hid because we were afraid. Fear ended into Adam's heart when love left it. Sin canceled out the vertical love and fear took its place. And Adam said, we were afraid and therefore we hid. There was no love in his fear. Now I want you to see tonight that light dispels darkness and life takes over death, and light dispels darkness, and love dispels fear. Would it be possible for a person in this universe to live without fear? And what does it mean when it says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? In Philippians 2, 12 and 13. What does it mean when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge in Proverbs 1, 7? That's another kind of fear. That is not a fear that has torment. That is not a fear that brings condemnation. That is not a fear related to guilt. That's a fear of hurting perfect love. It's a fear of hurting perfect love that will not respond negatively to the one that does it. And the love is so perfect that it will not impute sin, that it will not be offended. And true godly fear in the only context given in God's Word fears hurting perfect love because love is so perfect and will not respond to it with any negative response but will go right on loving. And fear hates to hurt perfect love. But that's the only kind of fear I am to have. I am not to have a fear that has torment or guilt or condemnation as a child of God. I am only to have a fear of hurting love or a fear of the Lord in Hebrews 5, 7, which we, we discovered recently was a fear of a death that didn't include the cross. The fear of the Lord was the fear of death without the cross, and that's the only kind of a fear that I am to have, a fear that I will be separated from God without the cross doing it, and that will hurt his love, and that's a reverential, sweet, kind, considerate, thoughtful fear. But I'm not to have a fear that has torment or guilt or condemnation or anxiety. That's why a true child of God doesn't believe in anything but eternal redemption in Hebrews 9, 12. He doesn't believe in temporal redemption where your salvation depends upon your ability to stay in God's grace through work. But a true child of God never fears that. He knows eternal redemption is eternal. He knows that of all the Father has given the Son, He loses nothing in John 6, 39. He knows 
that he received eternal life and it's not temporal life in John 10, 28. He knows whatsoever God does, he doeth forever in Ecclesiastes 3, 14. A true child of God is the recipient of divine love and divine light and divine life never fears God being anything but immutable. He knows God is immutable. He doesn't fear God canceling out his immutable attributes toward him. He knows God will never change regardless of what he does once that man has been received in Jesus Christ because he changes not in Malachi 3, 6. He's immutable in Hebrews 13, 8. He can trust the love of God to be immutable. The life of God to always overcome his own death, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. And he can trust the light of God to always win a victory over darkness. He simply can trust God without leaning unto his own understanding in Proverbs 3, 5. And therefore, totally trusting God, he can respond to God's love. And there is no love in fear. In the moment I start fearing with guilt and condemnation, then there is no love in it. There is nothing but the fall in it. Because Adam said, I was afraid and I hid. Genesis 3.10. There is no love in that statement. There is guilt. There is fig leaves. There is separation from God. There is insecurity. There is incompleteness. There is no love in it. Love thinks no evil in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love will not impute sin in Romans 4, 8. Love has no fear, 1 John 4, 18. Love never leans under its own understanding in Proverbs 3, 5. Love is the essence of God's life and the character of God's life. Love illuminates everything outside of the essence of God's being. And even as the eternal property of life, with its agelessness, travels in to the areas of darkness, and the only reason that darkness existed is because of the absence of light, and the only reason that fear and guilt exist is because of the absence of light, and fear relates to darkness. And light relates to love. And even as love gives grace to overcome darkness without imputing work and gives grace and a gift of forgiveness, even so light illuminates the mind of the forgiver and love characterizes the nature of his expression to the individual living in darkness. And the darkness is overcome by light. And death is overcome by life, and love overcomes fear, and the person with his inhibition and his fears and insecurities is liberated from the fall in which he is afraid with Adam, and he takes on the boldness in 1 John 4, 17 of Jesus Christ, because as he is, so are we. No longer does he live in any form of insecurity. No longer does he live in any phase of darkness because light takes it over and love takes over fear and light takes over death. He is free from himself. He's free from the fall. He's free from the world system. He's free from potentially all that he'd be around people in the world system. He's free from heredity. He's free from tradition. He's free from his social environment. He's a free man. He is no longer a servant of sin. But now he stands in the liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and is not entangled again with the yoke of bondage in Galatians 5.1. He's a new creature in a new creation. He's a new person with a new personality. No longer is he occupied with the masses of personalities which had dominion over his individuality that made him many individuals in the conflict of confusion as he reiterated what they were in this present world system into what he is. But now, integrated within his soul is who God is. And he becomes one with Jesus Christ as God's individual. 
And the first thing that God does to him is cast out all the fear that came because of death, spiritual. That came because of the threatening death eternally and physically. And God cast out that fear first so that he realized he is as God is and God is one who does not fear. Isaiah 42, God is not discouraged, neither is he afraid. He fears not. Now then, the psalmist said in 27, The Lord is the light of my salvation. And whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? The psalmist said, since light came in, it took down all my mental blocks that darkness initiated and established. And light took down all my mental blocks so I don't have to hide behind fig leaves. I don't have to hide behind insecurities. I don't have to ever fear again. Light took over my mental block. No longer am I living in insecurity. Now, when light did that, I realized how weak I was. So the Lord became the strength of my life through the light that dispelled my fear. And then I took on the character of God, love. And the psalmist said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not fear the evil of condemnation, the evil of guilt, the evil of insecurity, the evil of tomorrow, or the evil of the past, or the evil of the present. I will be as he is. Unchanging in my attitude. And totally liberated in my spirit. And totally filled in my soul with God. Now, what does it mean there is no love in fear? If I love you, I will not fear you. Now, my divine love will take care of fear in its three dimensions. The past, the present, and the future. From Adam right down to the cross. You wouldn't believe the fear that characterizes women in a home living with certain husbands. And you wouldn't believe the fear that characterizes the men around certain women and the children around certain parents. Fear of what liquor will do, envy will do, jealousy will do, nagging will do, murmuring will do. Fear of what one another will think and what one another will say. And fear characterizes their human nature. And love is not there. And then, when one is filled with the Holy Spirit, fear is dispelled and love casts out fear. And then what is the relationship like? Well, darkness is gone. We can be transparent. Death is gone. We don't fear un the unknown. Fear is gone. We have no insecurity. We live as he is. And how is he living? He's seated at the right hand of God. He's finished the work. And because he said it is finished in John 19.30, he's resting. Not in a day, but an eternal day. Not on a Saturday or on a Sunday, but in the eternal day of Psalm 118, verse 4. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice ye in it. No longer are we confined to seven days and seven nights. Now we're in what the Bible calls the day of the Lord. And what is the day of the Lord? The day when ever since the Lord triumphed over sin, over death, over the devil, over demons, over hell, over us, with the cross and buried us. Now we're living in the day of the Lord's mind, in the day of the Lord's emotion, in the day of the Lord's love, in the day of the Lord's will as a Christian community. And by the grace of God, we have no fears because there's no room for fear in eternity. 
and we're living the eternal is in this world of God. And there's no room for darkness because light always comes in and dispels it. And there's no room for death because whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this in John 11:25? We've been quickened and made alive by Jesus Christ. No longer does a child of God live in submission to the devil or self or the world or to the flesh. He has truly been liberated. He will not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage which self and sin and the devil paralyzes his potential with, with the innermost being of frustration. No longer will he be cast down. No longer is he the tail in Deuteronomy. Now he's the head. No longer is he on bottom. He's in heavenly places. No longer can Satan have dominion over him. He has the title deed and he has dominion over the devil. No longer does the law and rule and the flesh rule him. Now grace does. He is free indeed because the Son of God has made him free. Free from death and free from fear. Fear which comes from death and darkness. There is no love in fear. When Abraham was asked by God to t kill his only son that he waited so long for, Genesis chapter 22, he didn't fear. He offered Isaac on the altar and he didn't fear. Why? Because there is no love in fear, and he was so filled with love, there was no room for fear. He so trusted God, there was no room for distrust. What is the best way for a man to walk in the eternal is? To walk as he is in what he says, through who he sent, the Holy Spirit, in the protection that he's given the corporate body. And that's why I may say tonight that rarely would I ever advise anyone to leave a living body unless they're grounded. The most important thing for you, if you ever get away from the body without maturity, without knowledge, Satan will shoot you down so fast that you won't even begin to know who shot you. There is no fullness outside of those that manifest Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see something tonight. How can I get a victory over the flesh? By talking about it, we said in the introduction, no. By analyzing it, no. How can I get victory over the flesh as a Christian? By simply walking in the Spirit. How can I get victory over fear by simply walking in love. Ephesians 5, 2 says walk in love. Galatians 5, 16 says walk in the Spirit. How can, what is the best way to live in victory? Walk in creative objectivity. Jesus Christ is resting because the work is finished. And I'm resting with him because the work is finished. Jesus Christ has much more to do, but in his mind it's already done. I have much more to do, but I have the mind of Christ as far as faith goes, it's already done. There is no fear. No matter what happened, it doesn't disturb the plan of God because God is all-powerful. No matter what happens to me, it doesn't disturb me because it's going to work out for good and God is all-powerful. I have no fear. Because I know one that absolutely has total control of every single thing that happens and he's living inside of me. And therefore, by the grace of God, how do I get victory over the flesh? By walking in the spirit. How do I get victory over fear? By walking in love. How do I get victory over my weakness? By walking in God's strength. How do I get victory over darkness? By walking in the light. I don't sit around talking about darkness or death or fear like hundreds and thousands do. I just simply walk in life, in love, in the spirit, and in light. And that takes care of the negative. Why sit around talking about the negative? Why not just walk in the positive? 
Why analyze why it happened? Why not enter into what was done about it? Why waste your time wondering why Charlie did it? Why not get Charlie to enter into who took care of what he did? Why analyze what makes you fear? Why not just walk in the one that took care of it once and for all as a gift of grace because of love and is willing to give you the light of it to illuminate your mind? Why spend any time rationalizing when all you have to do is realize God? Listen, the Word of God makes it clear that God can do nothing against the light except yield to it. Fear can do nothing against love except to be overcome by it and cast out. And death cannot do a single thing to eternal life except yield to it. When Jesus Christ raised people from the dead, he said, Come forth! And death was taken over in a second by by the resurrection power of life. It's not a process. It's a moment of instantaneous faith in Jesus Christ's power, life, love, and word. It doesn't take time. It takes people who live in the eternal is in time. Listen. Satan has a program to try to get you to be who you are and live in the three dimensions and strive in a good work system to God to change it. Instead of letting Jesus Christ pass the sentence of death on you with it all. Through the cross. Satan wants you to strive to get victory. And Jesus Christ wants to bring the sentence of death on you to get rid of the thing that's making you strive. Satan says pray more. Plead more. Try more. Read more. Witness more. And God says Stop striving and die and let me come in and do what I want to do with you. Satan says compare. Jesus Christ said the only one I want you to compare yourself with is me. And then I'll give you my life for that comparison. Jesus Christ doesn't go along with practically anything in the world system of evaluation. Jesus Christ brings in a new measure of value. They're eternal. He brings in a new kind of love instead of rationalizing a hundred different ways about the old kind. He brings in a new kind of life instead of trying to patch up the old one and make it in, and to improve it and make it better. He says, I will not put a new patch on the old pants I will not do it. It will be worse than it was. Jesus Christ, in no wise, wants to try to patch up the old. He doesn't want to counsel the old, to deal with the old. He wants to make you brand new. He wants love to cast out fear just like that. And life to take over every area of spiritual death. And light to take over areas of darkness. Not through a series, but through the spontaneous dynamite of the power of God now. Jesus spoke and the world came into being. And it didn't take him 6,000 years either. You want to argue about the years and years in archaeology? Come come right ahead. And I'll show you eight acid tests how they've changed. Three years ago the instruments told them something. There's a new instrument that denies what the instrument said three years ago. And the instrument three years ago denied what the instrument said eight years ago. And the instrument eight years ago denied what the instrument said twenty years ago. And there'll be an instrument probably next year that will deny the year this year's instrument. And Spencer disagreed with Huxley and Huxley disagreed with Spencer and Spencer and Huxley disagreed with Darwin. And Max Plant disagreed with someone else and Newton disagreed with someone else and Einstein proved that it was a much better theory than all of them ever had. It is such a precious privilege that everyone here tonight doesn't have to live with repression. Repression produces depression. I can actually live without repression. And repression always results in using someone else as a scapegoat for my expression.
to cover up my own depression because of inadequacy, because of fear. And I can be free. With everything bad about me taken care of in Jesus Christ's life reigning in me forever. And by the grace of God tonight, somebody fears breaking this off. Somebody fears their job. They fear their finances. They fear the Christmas season because they're not going to have money enough to give and do. They fear this and fear that. God planned it before the foundation of the world that you would go through that to get to know what life is all about from the eternal viewpoint. God isn't interested in the temporal, only that the temporal can be used to introduce you to a strong, dominating principle about the eternal aspect of your life. God wants to get you to the place where you can say, though he slay me, I will trust him. And he wants you to realize that the only thing that really counts is who he is. And that's all. The only thing that really counts is what he's done. And when I understand what he has done and who he is, and I'm accepted in who he is, and I've been accepted in what he's done, and therefore he can work out what he wants to do through me. When I understand that, I've entered into a brand new dimension, fearless as far as the world goes, filled with love, filled with light and filled with light. Fill with eternity to take over the aging mind and the aging emotions and the aging body. Fill with that that's dynamic. Fill with that that's God. So that God enters into every room of our heart and every single situation of our lives. And so that the grace of God can reign. And we enter into as he is. So are we in this world. No longer do we spend the hours talking about the defects. Talking about the consequences of the fall. Talking about the results of our heredity. Talking about the problems of our job. Talking about the confusion and complexities in our social environment. No longer do we talk about physical defects. No longer do we talk about these things. But now we live as he is, more than a conqueror, resting with love that's immutable and perfect, with life that's eternal and inexhaustible, and with light that always dispels darkness and can never be taken over by it. We live in the three L's, and we live in the power of the three arms, and we live a supernatural life. We've graduated from the earth through the cross. We've now citizens of heaven, and we take on a dimension that makes us seated, and at the same time living in a practical way with a descended characteristic of God coming through us, which is absolutely one that always causes us to triumph in 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now, do you realize what happens if sin cannot condemn you, and it cannot because it's been dealt with forever, then if sin is gone, there can never be any more guilt. I don't get guilty if I sin. I hate my sin, but I don't get guilty because there's no condemnation. You say it gives you a license to sin. No, it doesn't. I hate sin because I've got the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ doesn't give me the license to sin. But if I sin, I don't magnify the sin. I magnify the Christ. If death comes, I know it has no power. It just takes me to heaven. So I don't magnify the death. I magnify the Christ. If darkness comes and I'm in a situation that I can't figure out, I magnify the light and I don't even try to figure out the darkness. For me to live, say it with me, is Christ. For me to live is not darkness, is not fear, is Christ. Every child of God in any situation can have perfect love 24 hours a day that casts out fear any time. Now, if I'm abiding in Christ, I'm always abiding in the light and in love. And there's no love in fear. So I can say goodbye to my insecurities. Goodbye to my inadequacies. And I'm not going to try to learn how to get victory over them. I'm going to learn Christ. He is my victory in the is life over them now in this world. 
It doesn't take time, it takes Christ. And in the sense that I'm speaking tonight, it doesn't take experience either, it takes Christ. It doesn't take earthly knowledge, it takes Christ. With earthly no heavenly knowledge and heavenly wisdom. It doesn't take anything here, it takes Christ into everything here. It doesn't take God changing my circumstances, it takes Christ in them. It doesn't take God doing anything for me, it's simply abiding in what he's done for me and let him live through me. How many understand? And you can live and I can live by the grace of God in perfect love, in eternal life, and in the brilliant light of God. Be renewed in our minds. Have the most precious controlled emotions ever possible. And never, consistently speaking, never have to be confused in our will. I don't need to ask what made me. I only have to take on the light. If I could communicate that to you, it would save everybody so much unnecessary wasted work. You can have it if you want. Or you can go just as long as you want to without it. I can be as he is. If I got saved yesterday, I could be as he is today. For today. By believing what I said tonight. Letting Christ be real through me. So Satan has a hundred thousand programs going to try to rob God from his supernatural love, light, and life doing the work. He gets people occupied with the negatives and the consequences of the fall, striving toward God to change it. Instead of getting them walking in the creative objectivity of Jesus Christ, which automatically takes care of it, with the positive, affirmative side of God's life. The next time you say, what makes me like this? Don't ask that question. That's a tree of knowledge question. Walk in the answer. Talk in the answer. Pray in the answer. Sing in the answer. Worship in the answer. Don't ask the question, why? Thank God for the fact that he is. It isn't why. That always gets you in the tree of knowledge. It's he is, which is the answer to all the why. It isn't what made me do it. It's thank God he's taking care of what I've done and he's, he is my life to stop me from doing it in the future. And I will not be intimidated for what I've done. And I will not be intimidated because somebody has paid for it for me and it's met the demands of a just God. I will not be intimidated for anything. I will live as he is. And Jesus Christ is not intimidated. Jesus Christ is not guilty. Jesus Christ does not fear. Jesus Christ isn't afraid. Is it any wonder he said to Joshua, because Joshua was afraid to lead Israel after Moses, the great leader died. He came, and I like that. He shouted out to Joshua in chapter 1 and verse 9, Be not afraid! That's what he always said. Be not afraid. Be not afraid of anything. Because everything is controlled by omnipotence, by omniscience, by the omnipresent God. Be not afraid. Don't be afraid of the Red Sea, even though the enemy's behind you and you, they're going to, it looks like they're going to destroy you because you can't possibly go through and they outnumber you. Be not afraid. Be not afraid of death. Be not afraid of anything. Fear not. Hebrews 13. For I am with thee, and I will help thee, and I will leave, never leave thee. So fear not what man can do unto you. Fear not what your own life has done unto you. Fear not. Let love, which forgives, which thinks no evil, which believes the best, which will not impute sin to you, which will not impute guilt to you even when you're guilty. Fear not, and let love cast out fear, and fear not. Fear not anything, death or anything else. 
for I am eternal, and I've accepted you and you're living in me. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?